It's Tuesday, May 7. In the headlines, Education Ministry committed to the care and protection of children. In business news, Jamaican-owned Scotch Boys expanding in the United States. Regionally, Belize celebrates 50 years with Caricom. And in sports, Haley Matthews nominated for Player of the Month. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Minister of Education and Youth Favel Williams says the ministry, through its agencies and programs, is working to increase public awareness of every child's rights. She says the ministry is collaborating with the Children's Affairs Policy Division and the Child Protection and Family Services Agency to empower children and their family with information related to their rights and responsibilities celebrate and affirm children and promote positive engagement, heighten public awareness of the issues negatively affecting children and the impact these have on their development, as well as steps to be taken to address these issues. She says parents, guardians, relatives and society all have a role in nurturing, guiding and protecting children, the future of the nation. Minister Williams was speaking at the Saxe Thorpe Methodist Church on Constant Spring Road in Kingston recently. Jamaica recognizes the month of May as a child month. It's being celebrated under the theme, Stand Up, Speak Out, Protect the Rights of Our Children. The month-long celebration will be punctuated with several activities, including the National Child Online Protection Forum on the importance of protecting the children in online spaces, and the 31 Days of Children's Rights campaign launched on the ministry's social media platforms aimed at disseminating vital information on children's rights. The Heart NSTA Trust says it has achieved a major milestone in enhancing the National Technical Vocational Education and Training System by integrating cyber physical components in its various programs. More in this report from Danita Rodney. Dwayne Ben, Director for Training Infrastructure Development at the Heart NSTA Trust, acknowledged that there has been a lack of focus on staying abreast of the evolving trends and standards impacting fourth and fifth generation technologies over the years. Consequently, he informed GIS News that over the past year, the Institute have revamped their efforts collaborating with leading groups to integrate the cyber-physical component into their programs. As we continue, the infusion of the technology is critical. We, over the years, we may not have been focusing on the continuous strengthening broadly on the standards that affect these fourth, fifth revolution technologies. And so for the past year, we have intensified our effort working with lead groups, standards department, NCT vet and industry representatives and international partners. And what we have been doing is to integrate the cyber physical component into these programs. And so far over 27 occupational areas have been upgraded and launched to the national TVET system um, to bring on board. He said these enhancements are poised to transform a multitude of programs. And these will impact, these impact a number of programs, our top 20 program, and it does not necessarily limit to, you know, are pretty much those that are the key drivers of the technology to increase and strengthen productivity in the industry. Some of them would have mentioned already, but just a few things such as process automation, industrial automation, industrial robotics, um, plastic dye engineering, plumbing and heating system technology, industrial electronics, drywall plaster and building decoration and finishing technology techniques, um, agricultural technologies, and of course, multimedia technology and mechatronics. These are some of the areas, in addition to those mentioned earlier, that together encapsulate what is required to drive industries across the world with the use of the cyber physical system. Reporting for the news on PBCJ, I'm Danita Rodney.
The agriculture sector plays an integral role in the socio-economic sector of Jamaica, especially in rural areas. Jamaica reportedly has 154,000 smallholder farms. At times, crops get sick in the same way as animals, and some small farmers lack the skills needed to identify and treat the diseases affecting their crops or viability of the soil on their land. This results in the loss of their harvests and revenues. They are getting help through a program called PlantWise, which trains plant doctors. Marlon Samuels has more in this report. Jamaica's food security is tightly woven to the performance of the agricultural sector. The island's food security has been affected by the increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as droughts hurricanes, and floods due to climate change. The Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries has introduced a number of initiatives to promote the economic development of small farmers in rural communities. At the same time, increasing the country's food security and safeguarding its natural resources by teaching farmers improved farming practices. One such initiative sees farmers being trained as plant doctors. The program is being administered by the Jamaica Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA. A plant doctor is somebody who is trained under the PlantWise program that is geared at helping farmers to lose less of what they grow due to plant health, due to pest problems. So the PlantWise program is uh, a program on, that is done by the Center for Agriculture and Biosciences International that has their headquarters in the UK that has this program that is spread across to over 30 countries globally. Jamaica has been a part of the Global Soil Doctors program since 2015. The Farmer to Farmer Training Initiative is being designed to teach farmers sustainable soil management. This in a bid to increase productivity and by extension, Jamaica's food security. The farmers are given five days of training. You are given a manual. It does, goes through systematically as to what it is that you will do. How do you differentiate between a fungal issue, a bacterial issue, etc. Some key concepts that um, it takes you through. And then for a number of the, 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 the training over the five day period is split into two. So while you would look at diagnosis, how you um, go about doing that differentiation, the recommendations for a particular pest problem, then you also are training how to conduct a plant clinic. What resources are you going to need? What are you going to need? So you're doing a plant clinic. The manuals are given along with other educational tools and materials. During the training, farmers are shown various soil testing methods they are also given a soil testing kit for preliminary soil analyses. Once the analysis of the soil is completed, the findings are documented. The farmer is then given a prescription to take to the farm store. If you think about it, um, a human health clinic, you're not feeling well and you go to the clinic, um, the medical professional, the doctor, the nurse assesses, looks at you, you do a prescription. Now, in a similar fashion, um, you are a farmer or you are a householder, you have a plant, the plant is not doing well. You take it to the plant clinic and a plant doctor um, looks at the issue, assesses it. We make, a, um, we try as best as possible to make that diagnosis, that as assessment on the spot. And then a prescription is written. You are not always able to do that, but for the most part, you want to um, make to say exactly what it is. It is a insect pest, it is a fungal problem, it is a bacterial issue, it's a virus, and then what are the recommendations that are made for that particular pest problem. And so that is done, and the good thing about it is that this is now documented. So the person who has the issue leaves now with the recommendation, either in hard copy, we have moved up since we started the program here, um, to actually using, collecting that information on the phone where you, um, it's done digitally rather, and then a SMS message can be sent to you, 
or if you still rather, because there are some farmers who would still prefer to leave with a hard copy, then the prescription is actually written out in a short format and given to the farmer. He can then take that to the farm store or to use for future reference and get that recommendation documented for what exactly he needs to do. This week's Living Healthy Report is a special feature on mental health from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. I'm Chris Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness. I hope you know that we care about you as a young Jamaican. I'm here with my team to share with you the importance of nurturing your mental wellness and to give you tips on how to do so. When you are mentally well, you can be your best self and deal with the challenges that may come to you in life. That starts with taking care of the whole of you. Now is the time to lay the foundation for your health mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. Hi there, I'm Senator Dr. Sapphire Longmore, government senator and psychiatrist. And my role is to help individuals like you achieve their best selves by being mentally well. As young people, you're at a crucial stage of life where you're exploring various interests, the subjects you like to study, the personal style that you have, the foods you like to eat, your hobbies, and even the company that you enjoy. These choices also help to shape the habits that will determine the person you'll become. This is your opportunity to lay the foundation for your holistic well-being. Over the next four weeks, we're going to have a fantastic series of videos planned just for you, each offering valuable tips to care for every aspect of your health, mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually. Our journey begins this week with a focus on your mental wellness, which is all about maximizing your strengths while minimizing your stressors. Today, we're going to be joined by clinical psychologist, Dr. Kai Morgan, who will share valuable insights on how to care for your mental wellness. So get ready to embark on this empowering journey towards a healthier and a happier you. Let's make the most of this transformative series. Dr. Morgan, this is a group about mental health, right? What is it really about? Yes, yes, Karis, a group around mental health. And really what that is about is our state of mind. Whatever life brings our way, Doc, you know, sometimes life rough, you know? Yeah, it does come with some heavy things, Jaden. Difficult times uh, and situations for many of us. And there are situations then that will make us laugh, will make us cry, will make us anxious, will make us disappointed. All these different things are a part of life and sometimes they become too overwhelming for us. And that's when we really need to kind of figure out how we're going to cope with it. So at that point, sometimes it's important to seek help, like come into this group session, or even if it is just talking to somebody who is really listening to you, that you trust in order to kind of help you to cope. What are some of these habits for my mental health? Here's the thing that we want to be, make it super important that you take care of yourself, your whole self, not just your physical self. So we eating right, we are talking to our friends, we are building connections with our family, we are thinking about being grateful, right? Looking at who we are and what it is and building that, what are our strengths. When it comes to our mental health, we really want to be able to think about what we do really well, what we're awesome at, and focus on that, build that as we kind of think about the challenges that we have as well, but we don't want to focus on that, we want to focus on what it is that we do well. Okay, so how do we do this? You can first of all sit down and make a list. All those good things are in your life that you're thankful for, that you're grateful for, because gratitude is really important. And put them, take steps to kind of put things in order in your life getting that exercise, going to the gym, playing football, maybe doing a little yoga or whatever. Don't forget laughter. Laughter is really important. That's an incredible remedy. And if you find yourself alone, remember that that's not the same thing as being lonely. Try picking up a book maybe, right? Looking into something that you're interested in but you never got to explore it and watching YouTube. And you can even use that for your work too, some of the schoolwork that you find difficult and find topics. Get into new skills, maybe learn a language, something, some kind of hobby that you're interested in and, um, and something that maybe can be exciting 
for you. So I see now that it's about building our strength in our connections around me and within. And it's not just about, you know, building a little muscle on the side. That's right. Not just about the muscle. It's about taking care of all of you, all the parts so that you're best prepared for life when these things come your way. And you best be prepared for the homework, right? That you're going to get for the next session. <laughs> So there you have it. I hope you found this video rewarding and I hope you think about the importance of your mental health. Remember, it's a state of mind and you have to determine your safe space for your mental wellness. So think about it and let's do it together for a better you, a better community. Jamaican-owned Scotch Boys, a company engaged in the manufacturing of sauces and seasonings, is expanding its reach to almost 300 stores in the United States. The company's CEO, Neil Hudson, says the founders anticipate strong sales from the partnership, which Scotch Boys will leverage its reach and bring the best of Jamaica's flavors and rich culinary heritage to the mainstream American consumers. Located in Savannah Lamar, Westmoreland, the company's products include the Honey Scotch Sauce, Hot Pepper Sauce, Jamaican Jerk Sauce, Jerk Seasoning, and Scotch Bonnet Sauce. Scotch Boys distributes its products locally through medical disposables and supplies. It also sells products on its website and e-commerce platform, Amazon. In April last year, the Scotch Boys brand secured placement on the shelves of over 250 Target stores in the United States. Time now for information on the movements of the financial market. During trading on May 6, 2024, the following companies valued at 500 million Jamaican dollars or more in assets represent the overall volume leaders on the main market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Toll operator Trans Jamaica Highway Limited with 3 million 405,457 units amounted to 30 0.88% of the market volume representing all stocks traded on the day. Alternative energy distributor Wigton Wind Farm Limited ordinary shares with 2,641,793 units amounted to 23.95% of the market volume representing all stocks traded on the day. Investment Trading House, QWI Investments Limited, with 1,211,712 units, amounted to 10.99% of the market volume, representing all stocks traded on the day. During trading on May 6, 2024, on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, the following companies represent the overall volume leaders on the junior stock market, with companies valued at 50 million Jamaican dollars or more in asset value. Auto Parts Distribution Company, Tropical Battery Company Limited, with 682,451 units, amounting to 25.92% of the market volume representing all stocks traded on the day. Hardware distribution firm Lumber Depot Limited with 368,183 units amounting to 13.99% of the market volume representing all stocks traded on the day. Insurance company Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited with 227,450 units amounting to 8.64% of the market volume, representing all stocks trading on the day. 
Over on the twin island republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, trading on May 6, 2024, registered a volume of 281,536 shares, crossing the floor of the exchange valued at 2,789,999 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and five cents. Massey Holdings Limited was the volume leader with 87,363 shares changing hands for a value of 372,297 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 75 cents, followed by First Caribbean International Bank Limited with a volume of 73,250 shares being traded for 507 thousand three hundred and one Trinidad and Tobago dollars and fifty cents. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives and companies, we turn to the Forex market. On May 6, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that U.S. $71.5 million was bought from Forex traders, while U.S. $54.9 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the U.S. dollar for $157.67 and bought the U.S. dollar for $155.99. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.68, which represents a profit for Forex traders for every U.S. dollar traded. Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $0.09 cents from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold for $115.90 and bought for $115.55. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $3.72, selling it for $196.44 and buying it for $192.72. For our credit report tip of the day, always check for accuracy. Before applying for a mortgage, meticulously review your credit report for any errors or discrepancies. Incorrect information could negatively impact your credit score and mortgage eligibility. If you spot any inaccuracies, promptly dispute them with the credit bureaus to ensure your credit reflects accurate information. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams. Appreciate your company. Stay well informed, stay ahead of the curve. Until our next update, take care. In regional news, Belize marked its 50th year in CARICOM, joining in 1973, just a year after its founding by Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad and Tobago. Annually, Belize engages in CARICOM Week, celebrating the group's significance and fostering regional bonds. Tricia Gideon. Deputy Director General of Foreign Trade emphasized this year's focus on Belize's milestone anniversary with CARICOM. Well, there's several reasons why it exists. Um, and there are people who can delve into the history even better than I can. But one of the primary reasons is we're small. And when you have many voices advocating for an issue, it makes it easier. As you know, we have had the Guatemala issue at the forefront for years, and it hasn't been a lobbying, and we haven't been lobbying alone. We've had the support of our colleagues in CARICOM, as we have done for Guyana and their issue with Venezuela. When we look at climate issues, is it done at one member state level? It's done collectively. So the reason we've been able to secure one of our biggest trade agreements with the EU is because we did it as a collective. And it is through funding that the EU has given the community that we have benefited from a number of projects. Caricom Week to celebrate the 50th anniversary. We've been doing it for years, but this year we are going to have a number of activities, but particularly focused on Belize in Caricom for 50 years. And we have an exhibition at the library in Belmopan. This will be a moving, a traveling exhibition as well. Um, so other districts can appreciate. We will also be doing 
presentation to high school and primary school students in Belmopan about what is CARICOM, who is CARICOM. And we will also be working with students in Belize City, high school students, for an art class to paint what CARICOM means to us. Trinidad and Tobago will receive compensation for the oil spill from the wrecked barge in Tobago. More in this report. Following an overturned barge in February, which caused an oil spill in Tobago, Energy Minister Stuart Young said government approached the International Oil Pollution Compensation Fund, which Trinidad and Tobago was a member of up until 2018. He said following the restructuring of Petrotrin, TNT was no longer making contributions, but noted that it was done since 2001 when TNT joined the convention. The fund, he says, covers reasonable claims for an oil spill cleanup, similarly to what occurred in Tobago. He said TNT made submissions before the fund on April 29th in the UK, which were successful. The fund's executive committee decision is as follows. The 1992 fund executive committee decided that the 1992 civil liability fund, civil liability and fund conventions would apply to this incident and they immediately authorized the director to make payments of compensation in respect of claims arising from this incident. Minister Young said central government will lead the charge to submit the claims and will days with the Tobago House of Assembly. With respect to the Tobago and the THA, again we will work with them along with the Ministry of Finance to look at the claims being made there and we at central government will take the responsibility of submitting the cost incurred at a reasonable cost that we believe can be recovered from this fund. He estimates that cleanup operations have so far been in the millions but hopes the fund will cover the majority. An estimate within current ballpark figures is about, I believe it is 12 million US so far. And then of course you have THA who are submitting as well claims to the Ministry of Finance. So when making the submissions to the, the fund, I told them, look, you're looking at something, I assume, but it, it, it could go up or it could go down in the region of maybe 30 million US dollars. The fund was fine with that. I mean, And as for tracking the owners of the abandoned vessel, he says there has been some leads, but that TNT will continue to work with its partners. Having seen all of the work that has been done by the Maritime Division out of the Ministry of Works and Transport, as well as our Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard using their intelligence contacts throughout the islands, as well as they managed to get help from the Canadian government and a number of other agencies. We've also contracted via the Maritime Division, an international satellite company. Sonolala, TTT News. In sports, the International Cricket Council has unveiled the latest list of contenders hoping to claim the ICC Men's and Women's Player of the Month awards following April's international contests. And West Indies Superstar is among the nominees. Tada! Outstanding from Haley Matthews. West Indies women's captain Haley Matthews is on a shortlist of three elite performers for the International Cricket Council's Women's Player of the Month. She has been recognized for her outstanding all-round showing during the recently concluded tour of Pakistan. Also making the list are Sri Lanka's influential skipper, Chamari Atapatu, and the lineup is completed by South Africa's talented batter, Laura Woolvart. Matthews is a past winner of the ICC Women's Player of the Month and current holder of the ICC Women's T20 International Cricketer of the Year, who is a top-ranked performer to have grabbed headlines in April. And guess who? Hayley Matthews. And again, this time off the front foot. Aesthetically, I'm not sure which to pick between the two. According to a release from the ICC, the 26-year-old skipper piled on the runs in her six outings for the West Indies, notching two brilliant one-day international centuries followed by back-to-back -back half centuries in the T20 international contest against Pakistan. Wow. Alongside her 451 runs in April, Matthews also flourished with the ball, taking 12 wickets, six in the ODI matches at an average of 14, and six more in the T20Is at 10.50. The next major event for Haley Matthews and the West Indies women 
will be the ninth ICC Women's T20 World Cup 2024, taking place from the 3rd to the 20th of October in Bangladesh. Wayne Cunningham, TTT Sport. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale saying pleasant viewing. <laughs>